Hi, Brad Long here in Elwood, the church. Uh, we're glad that you're here this morning. Uh, we want to remind you that the communion will be observed. Uh, you can pick up those elements on your way out, or if you're watching at home online, grab some elements to observe communion. Also, offering, you can do that on your way out in the buckets, or again, you can use the app online to be able to give your offering in that way. Next steps are available at greenwoodchristian.com, next steps. Uh, if you'd like to talk to someone, we'll be glad to talk to you. Uh, we're glad you're here. Church, will you please join us? Over the hills and everywhere go 
Savior of the world. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus Christ is born. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Savior of the world. Oh, he's the Savior. Why don't you have a seat? Let's check out this video. Hi, I'm Evie Smith, and I, when I get baptized, is I want to give my life to Jesus and to show everyone that I want to choose to follow Jesus. This is Evie, and she has come to be baptized today and to give her life to the Lord. Um, she has been asking amazing questions and with the knowledge that she's gained about the Lord, um, her love for him has grown so much this year too. So we are excited that she is ready um, to dedicate her entire life to God. Um, Evie, I'm gonna have you repeat some things after me. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. I, believe I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I now accept him. And I now accept him as my personal Lord and Savior. And my personal Lord and Savior. Evie, because you believe this, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. What an amazing season it's been just to get to celebrate so many baptisms week in and week out the last couple of weeks. Just really, really cool for us. Well, welcome to Green New Christian Church. Whether you're joining us online, you're here in person, uh, we want to welcome you. My name is Jason, and uh, we're excited. This is our annual ugly sweater weekend around here. So we love uh, all the ugly sweaters we see here in the room. Hopefully there's some folks uh, wearing your ugly sweaters, checking us out online. Thank you already for the text messages that I've gotten while up on stage to tell me this is the ugliest sweater of them all. I appreciate that very much. Uh, anyway, we, uh, we are glad uh, that we get to have a little bit of fun uh, together in this Christmas season, uh, especially with Christmas this week. It's a good reminder to dads. Uh, it is just about time for you to start shopping, all right, dads? So you need to get out there and get moving because you've got just a few days left. Uh, listen, a couple of things I want to let you know about. One is um, we, uh, during the month of December each year, uh, we have folks who are looking to kind of make some year-end contributions toward an extra project. So we always have a Christmas offering every year. And this year, all of it is going directly towards uh, Camp Allendale. That's a camp down in Trafalgar. Uh, they do just great, great ministry here um, for, for kids and families in our church and in so many other churches. And like many nonprofits this year, it's been a pretty rough year for them without any campers coming through um, Allendale this year. So we want to help make sure that they are there for years to come doing great ministry. So uh, you can hop on our website and be a part of that. All the money that is marked for Allendale will go straight toward Allendale. We're, we're glad to to help uh, work with them and partner with them in this season. And then in just a few days, if you can believe it, on Thursday of this week, uh, we'll have our Christmas Eve services. We'll have those uh, both uh, streamed online and for folks in person as well. 
Uh, we're really working hard to make sure those are uh, an interactive time uh, for both of those uh, groups, no matter where you are. Uh, as you're a part of that service, we'll have those at 2, 30, 4, and 5, 30 uh, on Thursday. And make sure that you're not late, whether you're logging in or you're here in person. Uh, we've got our rehearsal tonight, all ready to get ready for Thursday, and uh, we're kicking off with a fun element. So we want you to be a a part of that on Thursday for Christmas Eve. We think that the hope that we have in Jesus is just something we cannot wait uh, to continue to share with our world. Now, why don't you stand and let's continue to worship today. It's amazing to think that you would send your only son to us to live with us as one of us to feel all of our feelings and go through all of the heartaches and troubles that we go through and yet you didn't mismanage any of it you did what you planned to do and that line in there about all the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. We thank you for coming down to us and vanquishing our fears and giving us eternal hope of a life with you. Come and abide in us, live in us, and let us show you in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Christmas, and may the force be with you. Um, we got some really, really gloriously ugly sweaters in the house today. Like earlier, I saw some sweaters that actually have electric lights, so it kind of made the aisles look like airstrips. Um, it's really cool to see you guys here today, and even if you forgot about the sweater, some of us just have the gift of bringing the ugly no matter what we're wearing, right? So we're thankful that you are here with us today. Whether you are online, engage with us that way, whether you're here in the room uh, on campus with us, we're really excited to be together today. It seems to me that as a culture, we have this strange fascination with things that can kill us. We have documentaries every summer that we call Shark Week. There's this whole series of you know, videos about when animals attack. And then we have all sorts of creature feature type movies that I happen to particularly love. Uh, Alien, Anaconda, Arachnophobia, Crawl, Deep Blue Sea, Godzilla, Independence Day, Jaws, Jurassic Park, King Kong, Rampage. I mean, slew of movies just about lethal predators just wreaking havoc wherever they go. There are tons of books and movies about serial killers, about slashers and stalkers. There are scads of war movies. And how many disaster movies, right, have been made about asteroid strikes and earthquakes and floods and plane crashes and shipwrecks and terrorist attacks and tornadoes, tsunamis, volcanoes. If you think about it, even the popularity of things like roller coasters and zip lining and bungee jumping and those high altitude glass walkways, those things are really all about flirting with our fear of falling to death. Now, death isn't something to dwell on. You know, Merry Christmas, right? Death isn't one of those things we want to obsess over, but because you and I recognize that life on earth is temporary, we try in lots of different ways to hold illness and injury and death at arm's length. That's why we wear helmets when we ride bikes and motorcycles. It's why you fasten your seatbelt every time you get in the car. Our awareness of our own mortality is also why we flinch a lot when we're teaching our kids to drive, right? When we drive anywhere where there's a steep drop-off, we get accustomed to seeing guardrails along the shoulders of the road because we recognize the danger there. Everyone is required to wear a life jacket when you go whitewater rafting. Our schools conduct regular fire and tornado drills. How many of us remember a time when the threat of nuclear war seemed imminent and it caused a lot of buildings to be designated as fallout shelters? Anybody remember that? My elementary school had a basement that was one of those. People who work up high, people who do tree trimming for a living, for example, or people who work on power lines, or people who ride those little platforms up and down the sides of skyscrapers to wash windows, they wear safety harnesses and they tether in while they do their work. Military and law enforcement personnel wear body armor as a part of their jobs. And right now, we're all wearing COVID masks a lot of the time. We're spending a lot of time at home. Now, we recognize that we cannot prevent death, but we do everything we can to delay it, don't we? This is our third week in a series called Why Jesus. We celebrate Christmas every year, but in the midst of hanging lights and decorating trees and sending Christmas cards... Baking and shopping and wrapping gifts and wearing Christmas sweaters, beautiful, ugly, and everything in between. I mean, all of those things can be lots of fun, but it is easy in the middle of all of that stuff to lose sight of why Christmas exists in the first place. So we've tried to carve out some time all this month just to remind ourselves why Jesus came, what his mission was in coming. And so far, this is what we've said. We said a couple of weeks ago, with some help from Cody, that Jesus came to bring light into the darkness of our world. Last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus came to serve and he came to sacrifice his life for our sins. Now, this morning, I want to focus our attention on yet another reason that Jesus came, and that is to give life. But what exactly does that even mean? If you think about it, we use the word life all the time to mean all sorts of different things. We say things like, getting my morning coffee is a matter of life and death. We say, I can't for the life of me remember that guy's name. I was 10 when my dad first talked to me about the facts of life. He has a larger than life personality. She's always the life of the party. It feels like his mission in life is to make my life difficult. I had the time of my life at Disney World. So when we say the word life, we can mean any of a number of different things. We might mean the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter. That would include capacities like growth and reproduction, activity and change. 
So when we say that scientists are searching other planets for evidence of life, that's what we're talking about. Or we might mean just living things and their activity. You know, we have people in our church from all walks of life. At 2 a.m. in Whiteland, there aren't many signs of life. The existence of a living thing might be what we mean. You know, that car accident took the lives of three people. My life is in your hands. He couldn't be on time to save his life. Work like your life depends on it. We might mean a particular facet of a person's existence. You know, after his release from prison, he started a whole new life. Buddy, you need to get a life. We might mean the time between when a person is conceived and when that person dies. She lived her whole life in Indiana. Life isn't all rainbows and unicorns. Life is like a box of chocolates. We might mean the duration of functionality. You know, eating healthy and getting regular exercise can add years to your life. Regular oil changes will extend the life of your car. Or we might just mean vitality or, or energy. Our dogs, believe me, are rambunctious and full of life. You scared the life out of me. We talk a lot about life, don't we? And we mean all sorts of different things. Jesus also talked a lot about life. You know, the Gospel of John uses the word life 41 times. In the Bible, only the Old Testament books of Psalms and Proverbs use the word life more than John does. We're not going to refer to all of these by any stretch, but let me take us on a very quick kind of whirlwind tour, a sort of sampler platter, if you will, of the Gospel of John's references to life. John introduced Jesus like this in the beginning of the book. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Later in John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In John chapter 4, a woman who was ashamed of her rocky relationship history, she went to a well to get water at the hottest time of day when she thought nobody else would be around. But Jesus found her there, and this is what he said to her. He said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. After being criticized by some Jewish leaders for healing a man on the Sabbath day of all things, Jesus said, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life. To whom he is pleased to give it. Jesus went on in that same chapter to tell those very same religious leaders, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. After Jesus miraculously multiplied a small amount of bread and fish and fed over 5,000 people, he said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said that Satan is a life taker, but that he himself came as a life giver. He said the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Before Jesus raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Here's why John said he wrote his gospel in the first place. John chapter 20, John writes, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. This is John's way of saying, I did not write for you an exhaustive biography of Jesus, but these are written, the ones I have selected are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I mean, Jesus and John had an awful lot to say about life because our human desire to avoid death is nothing new. John knew that mortal flesh and blood people have always had questions and apprehensions about death, and that was a driving force in the focus and the flow of the gospel he wrote. 
the life that Jesus talks so much about has to do with a, a kind of light that no amount of darkness can extinguish. The life that Jesus talks so much about has to do with a kind of nourishment that truly refreshes and satisfies. A kind of existence that death cannot terminate. And a kind of purpose and hope that many people never experience. Later in the New Testament, the the book of Hebrews offers this really interesting reflection on the life of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 2 says, since the children... And contextually, Hebrews calls followers of Jesus God's sons and daughters. So it says, since the children have flesh and blood, Jesus too shared in their humanity. We don't all look alike. People come in all shapes and sizes, but we are all flesh and blood. We're all made of the same mortal stuff. And in order to fully identify with us, Jesus became human too. Long before that moment, the Gospel of John tells us that Jesus was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Jesus has always existed. He was present and he was involved in the work of creation. Jesus spoke things into being. He designed us. And then he became one of us. He took on a tiny baby's body... And he experienced childbirth in an up-close and personal way just as he had designed it. Just like us, Jesus had to learn to sit up, to crawl, to walk, to talk, to feed himself. He went through puberty. He fully shared in our humanity. And here's why. Hebrews says he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Now John, the same apostle who wrote the Gospel of John, also wrote three letters that we find later in the New Testament, and in one of those letters, John wrote these words. He says, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And it just so happens that on the basis of John's Gospel, we know what the devil's work is. Satan specializes in stealing and killing and destroying. He peddles fear. He deals in dishonesty. He promotes death. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that despite the Christmas lights and despite the decorations and despite the sweaters and the presents we see all around us, this is still a dark time for a lot of people. I mean, we all know people right now who are hunkered down, who are isolated, And alone. Most hospitals at this moment are not permitting visitors, which means it's a very lonely time to be sick. I mean, in the last nine months, I have visited a hospital maybe two or three times. It's a pretty rare thing anymore. People with loved ones in hospice care can't be with them in the ways that they'd like to. In recent months, many of us have discovered that even after someone we love passes, Even after someone dies, the restrictions in place on gatherings can make it really difficult for us to come together and celebrate their life. Many of us have altered our Thanksgiving and Christmas plans this year. This is the first time in 21 years my family is not planning to drive to Missouri later this week to visit family for Christmas. For a lot of different reasons, it sometimes feels like we are fighting a war that we aren't winning. And as I look back through history, I can't help but suspect that people probably felt very much that way as they saw Jesus, the friend and teacher who had healed sick people, who had walked on water, who had confounded his critics at at regular intervals, who raised the dead and who promised them life, die on a cross. You suppose that hearing Jesus say all those things and do all of those amazing things and promise all of those magnificent things, would have felt really odd as his disciples stood there and watched as Jesus hung dying on a cross. When I was little, uh, my dad read me The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, and I have loved those books ever since. Other than the Bible, I've probably read The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe more times than any other book. And there's a scene in that book when, the night before a great battle, Aslan the Lion leaves his army's camp 
to go and meet his enemy, the white witch, at an ancient stone table. And Susan and Lucy follow along behind Aslan, and they watch in horror as this mob of hideous creatures descends on him, and they, they tie him up, and they shave his mane, and they mock him, and they beat him, and he could easily overpower his enemies. Aslan is a huge, he's a mighty lion, but he bravely, meekly endures all of that, and he doesn't resist even when the witch raises a dagger, and she plunges it into his heart and kills him. And that scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe sets the stage for this one. You should go. Aslan. What have they done? knew the true meaning of sacrifice she might have interpreted the deep magic differently that when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead the stone table will crack and even death itself would turn backwards Hebrews says Jesus shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Jesus became human so he could die in our place for our sins and then from the other side of the grave turn death back on itself. Jesus was born so he could live, so he could die, so he could rise again, so he could defeat Satan... So he could give us life. That's why Jesus alone is entitled to say, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. When you and I choose to follow Jesus, we put our trust in the only one who has ever walked voluntarily into the jaws of death and then walked right back out by his own power. Only Jesus can rescue us from the power and fear of death. Jesus said in John chapter 3 that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not die, but have eternal life. John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, said later in that very same chapter, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. We said last week that the wages of sin is death. You know, ever since sin, ever since disobedience to God became a part of our world, death has been the norm. And unless Jesus comes back within our lifetimes, which is always possible, but unless Jesus comes back within our lifetimes, you and I will all experience a moment when our bodies die. And a lot of people live their entire lives in fear of that moment. But we don't have to because that isn't the end of the story. At Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus put on flesh, 
He showed us what perfect obedience to God looks like. And he gave his life for our sins to free us from death. For all of us who know Jesus, physical death is nothing more than a comma. It's not a period. For all of us who trust Jesus, death, I think, will be a lot like blinking our eyes one last time, only to wake up in the beautiful, life-giving presence of Jesus, where we will never die again. Only Jesus can rescue us from the power and fear of death. Yesterday afternoon, I got to be a part of a memorial service for Lori Coy's sister, Sherry. Sherry loved Christmas, and she loved Jesus. And last weekend, the day before she passed, she looked up at the crucifix that was mounted to the wall in her hospital room, and she told Jesus that she would see him soon. Sherry's favorite Christmas song was Joy to the World, and we played that song yesterday to close her funeral service. So you and I can live with joy in a world where death is inevitable because Jesus came to give us life. And that's why the most important thing that any of us can do at Christmas or honestly at any other time is to come to Jesus for life. So at this moment, while we're just a few days away from the actual Christmas holiday, let me just ask you, have you asked Jesus to give you life? According to scripture, we, we do that in a, a number of, of different ways. We, we ask Jesus to give us life when we admit that we have sinned and that our sin destines us to die. That, that's a part of this process. It means confessing the truth about who Jesus is, that he is the eternal God who for a time took on a mortal body in order to die for us in our place. It means trusting that Jesus' sacrifice at the cross when he gave his life that that fully paid for our sins, and that he then rose from the dead to give us life. Scripture says that asking Jesus to give us life is, is involved in, in being baptized as a request to be united with him and made new. And Scripture says a lot about the fact that if we are asking Jesus to give us life, then we're also making a choice to turn away from our sins, uh, away from the consequences of all of those things that have been a part of the way we've lived up until we met Jesus and walking with him for the rest of our lives. We follow Jesus together. This is a, a group activity. This is something we do in community. So we are here to help you. If you want to talk to somebody, if you'd like to learn more about Jesus, Jennifer talked about that in the video right before she baptized Evie. That was a beautiful moment this week. If, if you want to learn more about Jesus, if you know you're ready to be baptized, if you have questions that you have not been able to find answers to if if you just want to get more involved here or you fill in the blank you can go to greenwoodchristian.com slash next steps and you can let us know that and a member of our staff will follow up with you right away and if you'd like to talk to somebody today there will be a few of us standing at the back of this room in just a moment after we pray and whatever your next step is whether that involves a conversation right here or reaching out to us through that website greenwoodchristian.com slash next steps we would love to encourage you to take that step, and we'd love to meet you there and help you in any way we can. It's always a great thing to be together. This is such a powerful message that Jesus came to give us life. I want to ask you to pray with me, and then we're going to continue to worship our life-giving Savior. And if we can be of help to you, please reach out to us. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you this morning that we have life available to us. That God, even in a world of aches and pains and illness, disease, Father, even in a world where we know that death is a reality, that that's not the ultimate reality. We're so grateful that Jesus came, that he was born, that he emptied himself and he took on the form of a servant and was made in human likeness and that he experienced life as we know it and yet was without sin and gave that perfect life at the cross in our place. And God, we thank you so much, not only for that, but for the resurrection that followed, the resurrection that offers us hope of a resurrection of our own. And so God, we ask that as we uh, celebrate Christmas this week, as we get together in various ways with people that we care about, and Father, as we, we go through all the, the motions of, of many of the traditions of this holiday season, Lord, we ask that you would help us to do that incredibly mindful of the life that Jesus came to give us. Father, we need that life more than anything else. Thank you for allowing us to share these moments together. 
Lord, we ask that you would be honored here in this place and that you would help us to live our lives in a way that honors you as well. We ask all of it in the mighty name of Jesus.